Cleaning Up is brought to you by the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, my name is Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today is Fatih Birol. He's the Executive Director of the IEA, the International Energy Agency. He is, without doubt, one of the leading energy economists in the world. Please welcome Fatih Birol. So, Fatih, welcome to Cleaning Up. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for inviting me. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm delighted and thank you for spending a little bit of time with us. I'm actually very sorry as well, because in preparation for our conversation, I bought a Galatasaray uh, official T-shirt. Oh. But because of COVID, unfortunately, it's left in London and I'm here in Switzerland. Don't, don't worry, I will come to London and take uh, uh, this T-shirt. Thank you very much to you, very kind of you. Uh, as you uh, know, Michael, uh, I have two passions in life. One of them is energy, the other one is uh, football. And it's very kind of you. I am very touched, to be honest with you. Well, I was, I, I was, uh, I'm, 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 I'm very, you know, happy that you're. I was going to wear it for the interview, and then maybe if ah, you, 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 I thought you, you bought you, it for me, but it's even better that you yeah, have well, it for exactly. yourself. But, but, but to be honest, I, I'm not sure that I would have any other occasion to wear it because it might be a dangerous thing on the streets of London to wear a Galatasaray T-shirt. I don't know. No, hopefully uh, not. It is even more, more dangerous in Istanbul. I can tell you. So <laughs> this is. <laughs> it depends which bank of the Bosphorus, correct? You are if completely you're... right. If you are on the European side, no problems. You will even be invited for a cup of tea or eat baklava or something. Oh, really? But if it is on the, the Asian side, you might have some uh, difficulties. Well, I'd have to take it off and put Fenerbahce on instead, right? Uh, please don't go so far. So don't. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Well, look. Um, so let me let's start with some of the actual, you know, some of the stuff that's current that you're working on and that the IEA yeah. is working on. And the most recent um, was the uh, the the announcement that you will be producing a 2050 net zero scenario, which is yeah. pretty big news, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a big news. Uh, it is uh, something that we have been working on. Since September uh, last year, uh, we have never ever uh, uh, produced a full-fledged uh, scenario roadmap uh, in that uh, context. We check our models. As you know, we have two main publications, World Energy Outlook and the Energy Technology Perspectives. They have two different uh, 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 models. We have integrated these models in the last few uh, months to see uh, whether we could uh, provide a roadmap for the governments uh, around the world, how and if and under which conditions they can provide a, a net uh, zero emissions in 2050. So this is our uh, main preoccupation uh, for the time being, and it is a key priority for us. Very interesting. How does it differ? Because you have produced a sustainable development scenario, which was consistent with the SDGs, but yes. this is more aggressive on the energy side by quite a bit, isn't it? Uh, uh, definitely so. Uh, the sustainable development scenario uh, comes to uh, net zero in 2070, and this time we want to see 2050 uh, net zero. The main uh, uh, driver for this, and there are two uh, drivers. One of them is, uh, as you uh, know, uh, uh, as much as uh, me, maybe even better, Several governments around the world uh, made pledges, uh, e European Union, UK, China, Japan, uh, Korea, Canada, and I expect very soon some other, uh, I know, some other major emerging countries will join to this club. And the, if the United States uh, comes uh, to the picture, uh, more than two thirds of the current global emissions, those countries who produce more than Two thirds of the global emissions would commit to uh, net zero 2050. This is very good. Committing pledge is good, but <laughs> the other thing is how to do it. And uh, to put the pledge is not enough to uh, make this happen. So, therefore, uh, we are uh, working now to suggest governments uh, around the world what kind of energy policies, realistic energy policies, they can put in place to reach those targets. This is the number one uh, driver. The uh, second driver is that uh, uh, in your home country, in the uh, UK, we have a very important uh, 
uh, uh, meeting uh, this year, uh, the COP26. It's uh, perhaps one of the most critical meetings ever, not only in terms of energy, but uh, beyond energy. And I am happy that your government uh, puts a lot of uh, emphasis uh, and gives a lot of importance to that. And I have received an official request from the COP president whether IEA can uh, provide such a, a roadmap to underpin, underpin the, uh, the deliberations of uh, different governments, different uh, leaders. And it is the reason why we are doing this. And I, I can tell you, you know IEA very well. We are more than 330 energy experts here. Uh, I told them this is a key priority for the IEA uh, until May uh, this year. That, that's great, and um, and and it's you know it's fantastic to hear uh, that you're working on that. And as you say, this kind of these pledges have really changed the weather. Uh, yeah. Before we get on to those, though, I just want to clarify sure. on your figure of um, sixty-six percent of emissions, and how are you going to deal? Does that include China? Because of course, China has said twenty sixty, not twenty fifty. Yeah. So how are you dealing with that sort of ten-year uh, gap? So we also consider China part of this uh, game. And in fact, none of those countries, uh, they have uh, pledges, but except for UK and Netherlands, none of them uh, are uh, in love. They are uh, pledges. Uh, now, 10 years earlier, 10 years later, for me, more than this, what is critical is that whether or not those countries, those governments have the right policies to reach those targets. And when I look around, I see a big, big, big gap between the pledges and the uh, energy policies they are put in place and the incentives uh, for those. When I look at, for example, Michael, this sustainable recovery packages around the world up to now, uh, I cannot say that I am happy with the amount of incentives, the renewables, electric cars, and the others uh, received from the governments, but 2021 may be a, a game changer. It's a pivotal year. I expect the US government very soon will come with a big stimulus packages with a huge incentive on the clean energy uh, technologies. Right, because the, the, the previous big piece of work was that clean recovery plan. Yes. Um, and, and in that, if I paraphrase, you said there's essentially we're at a crossroads. We yeah. can have a, uh, we can either uh, build back better or bounce back brown, bounce back. Yes. With, uh, exactly. with 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 fossil fuels probably not appropriate exactly. to call them brown uh, but, but uh, the range of, of fossil fuels exactly. in the way that the bounce back from the great financial crisis occurred so we're now six months after that piece of work which I think was in April yeah. or yeah. more than we're eight months after uh, are we are we bouncing back are we building back better or bouncing back uh, badly as it were I am afraid currently the numbers are not encouraging. I can tell you now here in this uh, uh, interview, in this uh, discussion with you, that the uh, 2020 global emissions declined about 7%. Yeah. And at that time we said, if the recovery packages do not uh, put the clean energy at the heart of those packages, we may see a rebound of emissions. And what we see now, um, uh, Michael, is that we are going to announce the uh, exact numbers uh, in a few min uh, months of time. We are seeing a rebound of the emissions. I can give yeah. you one example, China. Uh, as you know, China is the largest emitter uh, of the world uh, today. And China is also the, uh, the country which went through the, uh, the, uh, the COVID crisis which uh, uh, and got out of the COVID uh, in in big sense, and the economy is rebounding. And when we look at the Chinese emissions as we speak now, currently Chinese emissions now are higher than it was in the year 2019. If we can take China as an example, if the other countries around the world do not take the necessary measures, uh, we may uh, see a strong rebound of the emissions, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. And before COVID, at the end of 2019, I wrote a piece called Peak Emissions Are Closer Than We Think. And here's why. Of course, yeah. my reason wasn't COVID. We didn't expect that. Um, but I did expect the peak to be before 2030. So somewhere around, let's say, 2025, 2026, and maybe a decline of five or seven percent by 2030 um, from from the 2019 figure. Um, COVID clearly knocked a big hole, but I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, you know, have we seen 
peak emissions in 2019? Or are you now saying, no, it'll be higher globally in 2021, 22, 23? And what happens next if we don't intervene aggressively? So 2019, the good news was the emissions were uh, flat. Uh, we came up with this uh, uh, number. 2020, big decline, and 2021, uh, I expect uh, unfortunately a rebound. But how big is this rebound? It is early to say. Right. But again, looking at the China is the first country when the economy rebounds. Uh, the uh, numbers are not encouraging. And when we look at the uh, economic numbers around the world, uh, many countries will see a rebound of their uh, economies. And if the pandemic is uh, under control, if the social activity uh, is uh, is going back to uh, normal, I am afraid this uh, rebound may be stronger than uh, uh, I am afraid today. Well, let's go back to that period before COVID just for a moment, if we might, because yes. when you said that 2019 was flat, if I'm um, if we go back the, the, the six years up to and including 2019, there were actually four years when the emissions were either flat or plus 0.1 percent yes, yes, yes there was i think it was 2017 and 18 were big you know was a growth spurt yeah but other than that uh 13 14 14 15 uh i, I can't i'm not going to get the years exactly right but i do know that from the last six years four of them were flat and the global economy grew 23 okay. percent in gdp okay. terms okay. in that period and emissions grew only three percent so yeah. when you hear people when you hear uh, in particular greta thunberg say you adults do nothing you've done nothing uh, what do you, do you not do you not sort of say well hang on a second this is we're actually kind of winning we may not be winning fast enough but we are winning we are definitely seeing a major penetration of renewables in the electricity generation, which is the best uh, news uh, ever. And them and some improvements in energy efficiency helped to uh, slow down the emissions growth. And in some cases, as you mentioned, uh, a flat uh, emissions. 2019, we talk, uh, emissions were flat vis-a-vis -vis more than 3% of the global economic growth. This was an excellent uh, uh, news. And if we didn't have COVID this uh, year, I mean, last year, 2020, uh, I would have uh, no reason to believe that such a positive uh, picture would continue. But winning is, depending on how you uh, uh, define the winning, if winning is to see a structural decline in the emissions, which I, yeah, I do want to see, then we need a strong uh, a penetration of the clean energy technologies to be in line with our uh, Paris goals. So here, therefore, there is a need for much more aggressive penetration of the clean energy technologies, and not only electricity generation, but in transportation sector, industry, and others. Yes, and I, I suppose winning was maybe a, uh, the wrong word to use because you know winning is net zero. Um, but, you know, I sort of look at it as well. You first need to get to a stable peak, you know, a flat plateau for a while. Uh, at least that would be a base camp towards winning. So maybe that's that's how I, I look at it. Um, but if we're going to see, you know, the, the really net zero, um, it's such an um, it's such a massive challenge. I don't you know. I'm not sure if you do. You, you probably have the numbers of. Um, per year, what sort of decreases we need to see in the next decade to have a chance? Because people talk about 7% per year, 10% per year. I'm not sure what the IEA uh, sort of figure version of that is, is going to be. So we will come to those numbers, uh, as I said, in May 18. So 18th of May, three o'clock, we announced the, uh, our numbers. But I can tell you one example for uh, two examples, maybe electric cars. Electric cars is something we believe can help uh, substantially uh, to reduce uh, emissions. And uh, today, uh, about uh, slightly more than 2% uh, of the new car sales, about 3% uh, are electric cars. And this should be, in the next 10 years, at least every second car sold should be electric car. This is one example. Second, on the electricity side, uh, today uh, we spent about uh, 
380 billion dollar for the uh, uh, renewable electricity uh, investments and this needs to be multiplied by four about 1.6 trillion dollar and just put in a context uh, michael the the entire energy sector investments uh, last year oil coal gas and in the entire energy sector not only power but industry, transportation, wherever, they were 1.6 trillion. So whatever we spent for the entire energy sector, we just need to spend for the clean electricity in order to reach the uh, our uh, net zero uh, targets. Yes. Tall order, Herculean effort is needed. Yeah. Th that's right. And in a sense, that's what I was fishing for, was some idea of the scale of the challenge. Um, mm. And of course, you know, the, the miracle cost reductions in renewable energy get us a long way, but they don't get us all the way there, do they? I completely agree with you. And one of the dangers uh, or the challenges, I should say, uh, I see is that some people think that the uh, everything can be done easily, but the uh, policymakers uh, are hesitating to do it. Policymakers may be hesitating to do it, this is something else, but it is not easy to do these things. You have to transform the entire energy infrastructure, which has been built decades and decades of uh, time. And uh, there are many complicated issues. The issue of the developing countries versus developed countries, issues of the, uh, the, uh, the already locked in energy infrastructure, coal plants in Asia, the, uh, the aluminum uh, and steel, if, uh, installations in developing countries, how we are going to transform them, it will not happen by sending a tweet or making some protests here. We need those, but those alone will not be enough. It needs cool-headed, well-designed plans for the transformation of the global energy system. And it is the reason why uh, we are, uh, as organization, taking this issue as our top priority to provide such a, a roadmap for the governments around the world, and of course, uh, for all other stakeholders. And I mean, I'll ask you a question. Do you find it frustrating in a sense? Because, you know, electricity is only 20 percent, exactly. 20 odd percent of the energy exactly. mix right now. And renewable energy, fantastic, but it's only 11 percent of that after, right. you know, a, a, a may, a may, I would consider that an incredible performance, far beyond what I had expected when I started new energy finance. Right. But it is currently 11 percent of 20 or 22 percent. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we have just so such a Herculean task. Yes. Do you find it frustrating that the public debate is sort of so far away from the energy economics? I completely agree. Uh, the, what is happening in the energy world and the public debate, there is a big uh, decalage, obviously. There is a big uh, uh, gap between those uh, uh, two. And um, i give you one very frustrating, one of my uh, uh, favorite examples. Uh, uh, you may uh, remember uh, Mrs. Brutland, the former prime minister of uh, uh, Norway. Uh, and when I met her, I told her the following. Uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, uh, Michael, uh, Madame Brutland made the first report on uh, sustainable development yes. some 30 years ago. Yes. And the, uh, at the request of the UN Secretary General at that time, I told her when she made this report, which one of the, uh, the main uh, goal was to reduce the share of fossil fuels in the global energy mix. 30 years ago, share of fossil fuels in the global energy was 80%, 30 years ago. And in the last 30 years, many things happened. The, uh, the, uh, in political terms, the sensitivity for uh, uh, clean energy became much stronger. Clean energy technologies became much more affordable. And the, uh, in Europe, for example, uh, the, if one political party wants to get votes, they just uh, to say green things is uh, very important uh, for them. And despite all of these things, this 80% today came down to still 80%. So this is uh, very, very frustrating. And this is, a, and this is despite uh, the, uh, all these uh, changes in the political uh, uh, spectrum, in the energy business, why? Because the, I think the uh, public debate misses one uh, point, one of the points that it misses uh, for me, Kivan, 
the biggest growth of the emissions do and will come from the emerging world. How do we sensitize, how do we incentivize the emerging uh, world to make the right decisions? This is my number one priority because we work, it is the reason uh, uh, very closely with the emerging countries. We talk about China. I uh, just last week, I had a meeting with the Chinese uh, environment minister together with the Chinese uh, chief climate negotiator. They asked uh, the international agency to help them to build their uh, roadmap to 2060, how, how uh, we can uh, uh, do that. And it is, of course, uh, we work with also with India, uh, with Indonesia very strongly. I think uh, it is important to see what is happening in UK, in Sweden, in France and everywhere, but the emissions growth are not coming from there only. Right. Is mainly coming from those countries. I think we should keep an eye on those countries and support them for their efforts. Well, indeed, the developed world, you know, you, is already um, decreasing its emissions, exactly. decreasing exactly. per capita, exactly. decreasing per unit uh, of economy, even taking into account uh, imports. It's actually the developed world has de has decoupled. When you look at it, that, you know, and and but the developing world clearly hasn't. Uh, and I I find it I I, I have found it frustrating actually for a long time that we don't talk about leapfrogging the yes. debate is around it's always around you know article six of cop this and cop these very technical exactly. discussions instead of saying okay look fundamentally isn't the issue that particularly with india and particularly with africa and some of the big countries indonesia malaysia and and so on uh, uh, vietnam uh, you know these big countries with big populations bangladesh pakistan we need to help them leapfrog not to go through the stages of development that the West you know, went up and then slowly starts to push emissions down, but to jump to that point. Um, and I, is that always just, is that wishful thinking or, or, or is that the right way to think about it? It is the right thing uh, to think, definitely the right thing to think. Whether or not it happens is uh, a different uh, uh, topic, but I have, there are many countries we talk about, uh, but for example, in terms of leapfrogging, one country comes to my mind because I work with uh, uh, India very closely. I expect India uh, to be a very strong candidate in terms of leapfrogging. If I have to put two keywords uh, here, one of them is the solar, the other one is the batteries. I think India is a very good candidate there. And uh, it is the reason India is... Uh, a priority country for the International Energy Agency. And I know from the Indian leadership that they are very keen to be a leader in the clean energy technologies. And, I, and we should expect uh, soon India to come with uh, some strong commitments in that respect. Well, certainly in terms of COP26, I'm pretty sure that, um, that, that the UK government, my government would be very happy if India was able to make quite a strong statement there, because that's now the, 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 the last big, well, I mean, there's obviously there's Brazil and a few others that, that yeah. also need to, but, um, you know, really the leapfrogging needs to look like Indians, as they become wealthier, they join the middle classes, their first car has to be electric, and they have to not go through the period of fossil fuel electricity, but go straight to, as you say, solar, wind, yeah. nuclear, geothermal, whatever else, right? Exactly. For yeah. India, I mean, there are, there are many opportunities, but two of them I can tell you. One is the electric cars uh, uh, you uh, mentioned. This is uh, very uh, true, together with the solar uh, energy going there. But the second one is the, uh, uh, it may seem a bit simplistic, but I think very important, which is, the air conditions. The, in India, many uh, uh, Asian countries, by far number one driver of electricity demand growth is air conditions. It is very normal in the, in the, in the United States, 90% of the households have air conditioner. In Japan, 95% of the house in air conditions, but in Asia, it is less than uh, 20%. So uh, with the increasing income levels, they will buy air conditioners. But today in India or in Indonesia to provide the same thermal comfort an uh, average air conditioner needs three times more electricity. 
because they don't have the efficiency standards in many of those uh, countries for air conditions for manufacturers. You know that we put a lot of emphasis on energy efficiency. I am thankful to you that the, you were a, a member of our uh, high uh, level uh, global commission on energy efficiency, which was chaired by the Prime Minister Varadka, former Prime Minister of Ireland, Mr. Varadka. And one of the recommendations of you and other high level uh, 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 members was uh, to engage with the emerging countries and to make sure that they put strong mandatory uh, air conditioners and other uh, 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 mandatory uh, measures for air conditions, other household uh, equipments. This is, uh, I think, critical. For India, leapfrogging can go through first electric car, by first car electric car, and solar, make the most out of the uh, solar, which is the cheapest source of electricity generation in India uh, now. And energy efficiency is a key policy yeah. instrument. And I'm very delighted to see that that work of the Energy Efficiency Commission feeding into, um, yeah. into things like uh, presumably the net zero uh, plan and-, and other, Very much so, um, very much so, yeah. IEA outputs. How do you deal, while we're talking about the developing world though, how do you deal with critics who say, um, particularly I'm thinking of maybe not the middle classes getting a car or air conditioning, but maybe the very poor, are they being disadvantaged by, you know, if we say, you know, Africa really should leapfrog, never go down the route of the uh, fossil emitting energy industry, that means leave your gas in the ground, leave your coal in the ground, leave your oil in the ground, uh, and do the right thing. And these are very poor people. How do you respond to that? So uh, this is a, the fairness is a key issue. I completely agree. Justice is a very important issue. And when you look at Africa today, when you look at the cumulative emissions uh, uh, around the world, Africa is responsible less than 3% of the cumulative uh, emissions, global emissions, but at the same time, it is one of the regions, perhaps the region, which should be hit the most. Now, but in Africa, if I uh, uh, tell, recommend the African ministers, I just talked with the Senegalese minister, to push for solar, it is not necessarily or primarily because of the uh, the saving the planet, which is true, but it is the cheapest source of electricity generation uh, uh, there. Now think about this. Another very frustrating number I want to share with you. When you look at around the world, the amount of solar radiation around the world, the highest in Sub-Saharan Africa, in terms of the quality of the solar, and yet in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, the installed capacity power plants, uh, solar is five gigawatts, which is in your uh, uh, esteemed country in the United Kingdom, it is three times higher than that. And I'm sure you will agree with me is that Sub-Saharan Africa has more sun than uh, UK, at least in most of the time, and uh, yet it has so little installed solar uh, power capacity. So it is the reason I believe it is. it makes sense from an economic point of view, leave aside the fairness issue. We are not telling the Africans, you should make these investments in order to save the world. We tell them, you should make these investments to provide your people, first, access to electricity, and second, the cheapest source of electricity generation, easier to build, easier to install. So. Let me do the following. I want to come with some of the sort of critiques of this vision, which you're laying out, yep. which is a rapid net zero, a rapid transformation uh, scenario. And taking that as the jumping off point, solar is fabulous, but the sun doesn't shine at night and you have maybe rainy seasons. You don't have such a pronounced winter in Africa, but in other parts of the world, you have seasonal challenges. When we talk about very cheap wind power, which is very real in the Northern uh, the, the northern parts of the of the uh, inhabited world, but of course you can have two three weeks without wind. How do you deal with the intermittency question? I mean, it's all very well to do the easy bits with cheap wind, cheap solar, the cheapest electricity ever. But how do you provide reliable power using those technologies? This is an extremely critical uh, uh, point uh, because if we can push the clean energy transitions. And if we forget the security of uh, electricity, 
then this may well delay the clean energy or electricity uh, transitions. Because if there's an incident, if there's a problem as a result of uh, uh, the intermittency issue, that you don't have uh, solar all the time, you don't have uh, wind uh, all the time. So uh, there are few uh, areas, and we are working at a key issue in the IEA. When I took over uh, as the head of the IEA, one of the first things is that I build a unit uh, which we call the, uh, the system integration of renewables. How to make sure that on one hand we push the clean electricity, but on the other hand, we make mm -hmm. sure that electricity is always there because people want electricity 24 seven. So there are some uh, areas from a system design to batteries are coming, hydropower potential. I see a big hydropower potential, which can use, which can be used as a, a, a storage. And mm -hmm. we may make use of uh, the technologies which are always uh, there when we push the button. This can be depending on the country. This can be a nuclear power. This can be something else, hydropower. Uh, whatever. So we should not forget the electricity security aspect. It is the reason why I want to come back what I said. It is not uh, only pushing the uh, button to send a Twitter that will happen immediately. It is a, it, this is a, a very well thought design of the energy systems which are very, very complex. Indeed, and you know, I find myself in a funny position because on the one hand, I've been, as you know, enthusiastic about wind and solar for as long as you and I have known yes. each other, which is some time, but I'm also very aware that these are real challenges. Um, yes. There is a real problem. If there is uh, two weeks with no wind in northern, in, in the, you know, if the UK builds its 40 gigawatts of offshore yes. wind and there's no wind for a few weeks, um, and, you know, then another sort of I don't know, critique, or there are those out there who say, oh, well, the answer has to be nuclear. But you can't use nuclear just for two weeks a year, can you? No, no. You can't use nuclear uh, uh, two weeks a, a year. And some people say you shouldn't use nuclear at all. Uh, there are also uh, views on that. In our view, the systems should be designed in a way that it secures uh, the electricity for the citizens 24 7. It should be affordable, but it should be uh, clean as well. And at the IEA, we do not exclude any clean energy technologies that are available today, and those will be available uh, tomorrow. And I, I can tell you, uh, with the current clean energy technologies, we cannot solve all the problems. We need new clean energy technologies to be part of the equation. Our numbers show uh, that uh, to, uh, we need huge emission reductions in 2050, and half of those emission reductions need to come from technologies which are not ready for the market yet today. So therefore, innovation is a very important issue. And I have high expectations from many countries, many governments, including the uh, upcoming uh, US government. And as you know uh, better than me, United States has been a, a one of the key drivers of the innovation in the energy technologies. And of course, together with the US, it is also it may be India, it may be somewhere else, but uh, we cannot solve all of our problems only with solar and wind today. And, and it's, it, I'm, I don't want to project, but I, I'm assuming that that is a whole bunch of different um, industrial sectors, aviation, yeah. shipping, exactly. steel, cement, exactly. those sorts of things, but exactly. also this question of longer term storage. Is that a fair characterization or are there other big areas where we still need complete new breakthroughs? It is a perfect uh, uh, definition, perfect uh, summary. Yeah. And are there any of those that you think are easier or more difficult? To be honest with you, uh, we are at the IEA, we are uh, a number driven organization. When I look at the numbers, I don't see any easy uh, uh, sector, but some of them are harder. For example, aviation is uh, uh, one of the hardest uh, uh, sectors. Uh, we are working on many areas on the aviation sector, ranging from the uh, electric uh, solutions to bioenergy and the others with the, some aviation uh, companies. But there are some easy ones, which is, as we talk, uh, electricity generation, where we have uh, uh, all of the available technologies, which are cheap, which are affordable, uh, solar and wind. And they also come uh, they, they don't come without any problems. Intermittency is uh, definitely one of them. And in some countries in Europe, there are also some uh, uh, social uh, objections, uh, to be honest with you. For example, for wind, uh, uh, some European countries, including Germany, 
we see some uh, challenges there and they don't want the rural people don't want to see a, a, a windmill next to their uh, villages so there are definitely uh, challenges and this is the uh, is uh, you know better than me uh, michael you are uh, you are uh, one of the philosophers of uh, energy as i told you several years ago when we were enjoying a glass of wine in the uh, in the uh, the terminus was the called uh, the name of the very nice restaurant close to uh, gardino uh, when it goes to eurostar uh, one of the things which makes the energy uh, sector very interesting is there are no easy solutions there are always buts it is good but so therefore it makes our uh, work much more dynamic much more interesting but at the same time much more uh, difficult so it is not so easy with the 140 something characters uh, we cannot solve the problems that's right. I always tell students it's the most fantastic area to get into. It doesn't you can be an expert on anything from decision science, anthropology, physics, chemistry, you name it, politics, uh, communications. You're going to be busy 24/7 in energy. I completely agree. But it's also fun. I and mean, when you when you turn on the television uh, or when you read the uh, newspapers, the cover page, there are very few uh, news which are not related to energy <laughs> directly or indirectly. Nowadays, it's a bit different because of the things what's happening in the United States. But normally, in a normal day, when you watch television, either through climate change or the prices or technologies or the, as we have in France, Gilets Jaunes, the, uh, the people who have difficulties with the, some of the uh, measures the governments take, they are always energy related. So we are not an abstract science or a sector, which is very much in the middle of the uh, daily debate as well. Absolutely. And I'm sure, you know, you could even argue that what's happening in the US, if you scratch not too far below the surface, you find energy. Um, but I wonder, I don't want to go down that we could have a wonderful, maybe next time we meet for a glass of wine at the Terminus, we should talk about that. Yes. But I want to come to one of the areas of innovation, which is uh, getting a lot of coverage and the valuations have gone crazy. Uh, and there's, you know, enormous amount of interest in and that is, of course, hydrogen. Um, the hydrogen economy has been you know, promoted a number of times. There's been a couple of hype cycles. And then I suppose the, the question is, is it different this time? And if so, why? So, uh, uh, Michael, uh, uh, I was like you working on the, and I, I am working on the energy sector since decades. I have rarely seen any technology that uh, everybody loves. Today, everybody loves hydrogen. But when I go one step lower, deeper, I should say, I am not sure they know what they love. So what is hydrogen and where and how much and, and so on. So uh, I am very happy to see that the many governments around the world are coming with the hydrogen strategy, with commitments, billions of uh, dollars. And I see a, a role for hydrogen, especially in the industry sector and so-called hard to abate uh, sectors. But even this to happen, we need to create uh, the demand. Without creating the demand uh, for the, especially for example, chemical sector, the petrochemical sector, which is very important uh, to decarbonize. But um, everybody loving the hydrogen doesn't mean that we will have a successful outcome. We need to see how do we create the uh, demand and how the hydrogen will help to decarbonize our energy system. You talk about uh, uh, the, uh, the storage issue. Uh, hydrogen can well be a very good, uh, a, 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 the long uh, term uh, uh, storage uh, the, uh, throughout the year for, I don't know, for offshore wind, for example, it can uh, play a very important role. So it can, it has to be designed very well for which country, for which sectors and what kind of value edit it can provide. So uh, our suggestion to governments is, uh, Hydrogen is important, but you have to design well so that it is successful. It doesn't become the love doesn't stay as a platonic love. It turns to be real love. And therefore, we need to focus on certain uh, areas which yeah. can create uh, easy value added. I, I, I like your focus on demand, because what I see is a lot of the hydrogen strategies that I've been asked to look at or that I've uh, uh, commented on. It's very easy to promote hydrogen production. Um, but then when people start to talk about demand in heating, which is so inefficient, or demand in vehicles, which again is so inefficient and complicated, 
Um, instead of focusing on, as you say, petrochemicals, uh, um, maybe aviation fuel, shipping fuels, uh, steel, I can see some real needs, but when people, so, and, and the long-term storage, but when people start to talk about it in transportation or heating, I gotta be honest, I start really shaking my head. Sure, we, governments have to decide where do they put their money? I mean, governments do not have the infinitive uh, budgets, where they put their money and what they get uh, out of this. And hydrogen is definitely one of the options together with all other clean energy technologies. So therefore the realistic, pragmatic uh, strategies will be very important. Uh, let, let me just touch on another area where I think um, IEA has come in for criticism. Uh, it's again a very difficult, it's part of this kind of there's nothing is perfect, but carbon capture and storage. Um, there's always a lot of carbon capture and storage in the IEA scenarios. And there are those who say it's really just a way of keeping the oil and gas uh, industry or the fossil fuel industry happy, the coal, coal as well, and historically perhaps more than now. What do you say to that criticism? Two things. Uh, first uh, are uh, the carbon capture and storage abatement we have in our scenarios is only a fraction of the IPCC scenarios. IPCC yes. is at least X times more than us. I mean, this is the, I'm very sorry that these people who make these uh, critics or uh, these points do not read. It's good to read sometimes. So they have to read this one first. Second, uh, the, as I told you, for me, the important thing is the uh, emissions. Energy is good, emissions are bad. So uh, we, we need energy, and if if we have the zero emission energy, wherever it comes from, I am very happy with that. But CCS is bound with a lot of challenges as well. So uh, you mentioned we talk about hydrogen a lot, but we have very little uh, 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 proven record uh, here, uh, the track record here. The same with CCS. We are seeing recently a momentum in, in, in the CCS, especially in the context of the, again, industry sector, uh, and uh, I see CCS, if it is going to be successful, I see more chances in the industry sector rather than the power sector. So, yes, it's, I mean, cement is a great example where it's very hard Not to exactly. see zero carbon cement without CCS, exactly. right? Exactly, exactly. impossible. How, how are you going to run the cement just with uh, uh, solar or wind? So we have to be very careful, but again and again, one of the things that uh, we all have to be careful, we have to study how the energy system works. Uh, this is yeah. uh, it is not a as as they say in German. You speak to them, It's not a Kinderspiel. It's not a, a small uh, thing uh, to do. It's a, it's a serious issue. It's the, the, these are very challenging uh, yes. problems to solve. I love the idea that you know when I brought up CCS and how the uh, IEA has been criticised. You you sort of you you mentioned the IPCC scenarios because you know that I've been doing my utmost best to raise awareness of. Um, the IPC, just how unrealistic the IPCC scenarios are. Uh, there's this particular one, RCP 8.5, which is the extreme scenario, which is a growth, uh, involves the coal industry growing by a factor of seven between now and 2100, when we know, you and I know, that the coal industry is shrinking. Exactly. Um, so, uh, but, but they also build in a lot of direct air capture or, or BECs or whatever you want to, uh, um, biological carbon capture and CCS. I mean, on a scale which is heroic, even by comparison to, to your own scenarios. I completely agree. Uh, so uh, we, in my view, we do not have the luxury of excluding any clean energy technology that, that is promising, but some of them, uh, may well not see the uh, light of the day, but from the beginning to exclude them for this or that ideological reason is not the right uh, thing uh, to do. Uh, there are some proven ones, solar wind efficiency, I would put efficiency uh, also there. And there are some uh, upcoming ones such as the electric cars moving very strongly. Uh, the uh, I would even say the batteries are moving very uh, uh, strongly and many others will come. And I wouldn't, uh, Michael, as some people do, I don't see the uh, the privilege to, uh, to exclude, for example, nuclear from the equation as well, because uh, nuclear after hydropower is the second uh, largest source of uh, uh, zero emission technology today. I know the difficulties, many difficulties from the uh, the financing to uh, the social problems, but it is the reality of life. I mean, today, 
in the United States, uh, about one fourth of the electricity generation, uh, if I'm not wrong, coming from uh, nuclear power, so is Europe uh, similar in uh, Japan. And if they are gone, if you uh, shut them down, all of them at once, who would guarantee me that it, it, they will be all replaced by uh, uh, solar and wind? And what are the implications of that? So uh, I am not pushing any technology. I want to see clean energy technologies and secure and uh, of course affordable. This is also very important. We shouldn't forget the affordability part of this uh, uh, issue. Yes, and, I, and I've certainly written about how you know nuclear. We cannot uh, shut down what we've got early because that's you know we we just that would be that would consign us to failure essentially on climate. Mm -hmm. um, but the challenge of the current generation being the economic challenge. But I'm very, uh, I'm very much in favour of experimenting with uh, funding the the next generations to see exactly. if it can be affordable. The other one I wouldn't write off is geothermal. I um, I did a lot of work on geothermal 10, 12, 15 years ago, and then almost gave up because it just didn't seem to. It never popped. But some of the innovation based on um, the drilling technologies, the closed loop technologies, not even fracking beyond that, the closed loop uh, advanced geothermal and uh, is kind of exciting and potentially scalable. So I would add that to the list of- uh, I, I would definitely agree with you. There are several countries in the world, especially in Asia, but also in the United States, there's a huge geothermal potential and this can add in many areas, uh, including the uh, heat, and this can be a, a definitely a part of the equation, definitely. That, that's an area I would, I would expect yeah. to see more action. So now, um, Fatih, we're going to run out of time okay. soon, but I need to bring up one final topic, which of is, of course, okay. oil demand. We haven't, we've got all the way through, and you started your career with OPEC. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and this Nobody's is perfect. Nobody's perfect. Yes, but no, no, I, I didn't say that in a in a, in a <laughs> joking, yeah. you, 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 you walked into the light. You've been moving towards the clean energy and the transformation scenarios. I'm very happy. Um, but, you know, BP stunned the world, I think it's fair to say, yeah. uh, at the end of last year by coming up with its scenarios, which are now essentially flat and then declining oil demand or declining at faster rates. Yes. And that's still not the accepted wisdom. Uh, I think all of us have got in the scenarios some sort of an oil peak, but BP st said, we may already have seen it. What do yes. you think? I think uh, you are right, uh, BP and some other uh, CEOs of the major oil companies and some uh, uh, leading uh, thinkers, uh, thought leaders said that we have already reached the peak. Uh, and my view is, uh, I am sorry, if there are no uh, strong policies, oil demand will rebound before the crisis level. And again, why I say this, people say because teleworking has started, there are some emergency measures as a result of COVID. These are, of course, important, but these are not game changers. If we don't see a big penetration of electric cars, for example, if we don't find a way to address the, the plastics issue, which is petrochemical sector is the main driver today of the global uh, uh, oil demand growth, we will go back there where we were before the crisis. Again, I come back to China because China is the first country which is getting out of the COVID crisis. Today, uh, Michael, uh, what confirms what I said uh, several months ago, that we are not, uh, we may not see the peak, it is China's oil demand today is higher than 2019. It is rebounding yeah. very strongly. So this is, uh, uh, therefore, if the, uh, we want to see a peak of oil demand uh, uh, in the world, we have to make sure that the governments uh, put uh, policies in place to give a room for the other uh, solutions which are not run by oil. Yeah, and you've written, or IEA has, has analyzed and shown also the impact of SUVs, that actually all of the wind, all of the solar in the world, that yeah. impact has been absorbed and more by the shift to SUVs. Yes, I mean, last year, 2020, uh, I mentioned 3% is the, uh, of the all, all car sales are electric cars, and 43% of all the cars sold in the world were SUVs. I mean, this is the, it is not only United States, as you may think, but it is also India, it is also China, it is, it is Europe and uh, elsewhere. So these are uh, numbers that we have to uh, uh, see and therefore uh, take the action uh, accordingly. Here's, here's then uh, a, a question. 
you've got all of these, this, the, the, the pressure for net zero and particularly yep. the European oil companies are responding and they're announcing their net zero. Uh, and a big part of the response to that strategy is to stop upstream exploration development. In the case of the more aggressive players, they actually have to divest and get rid of upstream because of the commitments they've made. If demand, as you explain, continues to grow, but supply is being constrained by those decisions, aren't we just going to see a huge oil price spike? I mean, does that, that concern may, you? Yeah, there may be a lot of volatility in the uh, oil markets. So uh, uh, therefore, many of the oil companies in Europe and elsewhere are uh, reviewing their uh, business strategies. And here, for me, a key issue is what will happen to those countries whose economies are directly linked to uh, oil prices and oil economies, those in the in, uh, Middle East, some of them in Africa, such as uh, uh, Nigeria, Libya, Algeria, uh, some of them in Latin America, because I can tell you, I can assure you, everybody, that no country or no company, oil company, will be unaffected from clean energy transitions. So therefore they have to uh, find ways to cope with that. If they want to, uh, their companies, their uh, countries to have a sustainable uh, future. Yes, and um, I think on that note, what a place to leave our conversation. We're gonna see a lot of volatility uh, and it's gonna be a, a pretty wild ride. I think we can definitely agree on that. I completely agree with you. Just to finish, uh, uh, Michael, I thank you very much uh, for all the work you are doing uh, uh, on many uh, clean energy uh, front. And uh, this our uh, climate challenge is essentially an energy challenge because the energy uh, uh, that powers our daily lives, our economies, our response is responsible also 80% of the uh, uh, global emissions. So it is the reason uh, uh, the IEA is very determined. I am very determined to lead global clean energy transitions with the colleagues like yourself and uh, others. I thank you very much for giving me this uh, great opportunity, Michael, and hope to see you soon and preferably in the uh, uh, restaurant terminus over at uh, Bordeaux. Well, any, uh, either in the terminus or at your headquarters or anywhere that I could do anything to help your work. Thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much, Michael. Here today. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. So that was Fatih Birol, Executive Director of the IEA, the International Energy Agency, talking about how the energy sector globally can deliver on those net zero pledges that most of the world's major economies are making. My guest next week on Cleaning Up is Stephen Chu, winner of the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1997. He served as Secretary of Energy during President Obama's first term, and now he's a professor of physics and physiology at Stanford University. Please join me this time next week for a conversation with Stephen Chu.